How many ways are there to split a polygon into triangles where the triangles vertices are the same as the vertices of the actual polygon itself? Say we use a pentagon, we could do something like this. Another choice is something like this. Maybe something like this. And then something like this. And something like this. So it seems like with a pentagon, there are five ways to do this. But what about in general? We're gonna answer this question and much more in this video and a follow-up video by Michael Penn from Randolph College that'll answer the question, how many ways are there to triangulate a polygon? Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar, and in this video, we're gonna count the number of ways to triangulate a given polygon regardless of the number of sides. So we're gonna to try to find a formula in terms of the number of sides for how many ways we can split a polygon up into triangles. This video is gonna have a follow-up video by Michael Penn, who's at Randolph College, and together with my video, we'll be able to get a total count, explicit formula, for the number of such triangulations. So to get a sense of this, let's start with some smaller polygons instead of this big one. So first of all, if we start with a triangle, we know there's only really one way to do this, right? Okay, if we started with a foregon, something like a rectangle or any quadrilateral, and we label the vertices one, two, three, four, then there are effectively two ways that we can triangulate, either split along the diagonal like this or split along the diagonal like this. So two ways here. And things get a little bit complicated as you move up in the number of sides. We saw in the intro to this video that if you have five sides, there are five ways to do this. And so we're interested in what to do in general for general n. So I wanna introduce some type of statistic that keeps track of these numbers. Since the smallest polygon we can have has three sides, what we'll do is introduce a statistic that keeps track of the number of such triangulations, but the index is gonna be a little bit off from the number of sides. So what we'll do is let C sub N be the number of triangulations of an N plus two gone. So for example, C sub one is the number of triangulations of a three gone, which is a triangle and there is one of those. C sub two is the number of triangulations of a foregone or a quadrilateral. We saw that there's two of those. And then in the intro to this video, we saw that the number of triangulations of a five gone is five. So here are the first three numbers that we have that count the number of triangulations of different polygons with different number of, numbers of sides. So let's see how we can get maybe a formula for these things, or at least come close to getting a formula. What we'll actually do is look at an eight gone for inspiration on how to get a recurrence that involves these numbers right here. Okay, so to get some inspiration on a recurrence that these numbers satisfy, what we're gonna do is look at an eight gone and I'm gonna fix the base of this eight gone and think about all of the triangulations involving this eight gone. I'm gonna label the vertices starting here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And think about the triangulations that we get. Now, no matter what, in any triangulation, this side is gonna be one of the sides of the triangles in the triangulation. So the question is, in the triangle that involves this side, which we'll refer to as the base, sort of the fixed base that we're working with, um, where can the other vertex be? Well, the other vertex is one of these points, two through seven inclusive. Let's analyze what happens when the third vertex moves in all possible positions that it can be in. So let's start with analyzing what happens when it's right over here. So if the third vertex is vertex two, then our triangle looks something like this. Now the number of triangulations in which this triangle is one of the triangles in the triangulation 
can be thought of as the number of triangulations of the rest of this polygon. But the rest of this polygon is a polygon with exactly seven sides, as vertices run from two through eight inclusive. So the number of these is the number of triangulations of a seven gon, and that number is C sub five. So let's change where this vertex is for the triangle involving this base and see what other count we get for the total number of triangulations of this eight gon. Okay, so let's think about what happens if the Third, the third vertex of this triangle involving the base is over here instead. So our triangle will look like something like this. Okay, so we have this triangle here, which we can think of as a triangulation of a three-gon. And then we have this, tri this polygon right over here, which has one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. So to triangulate the rest of this polygon, we need to triangulate this polygon right here and triangulate this one right here. The number of triangulations of this polygon is C sub one. It's the number of triangulations of a three gon. And the number of triangulations here is the number of triangulations of a six gon, which is C sub four. Since we triangulate each of these independently, the total number of triangulations of this entire thing is gonna be C one times C four. Now let's see what happens when you move yet another vertex. Now here's where we're gonna start seeing something interesting. So if this base triangle has this third vertex being vertex four, then we need to triangulate the rest of what's left, which involves triangulating this four gone here and independently triangulating this five gone. The number of ways to triangulate this five gone is C sub three, and the number of ways to triangulate this foregone is C sub two. And we're triangulating them independently. So the total number of triangulations in which this base triangle has its third vertex at vertex four is C two times C three. So we're starting to see a pattern. If we move this vertex along, the next time we're gonna get C three times C two because we'll have a foregone on the left and a five gone on the right. Okay, so we can keep following this pattern by moving this vertex around the outside of this polygon and we see what's gonna happen here. Every time we move this vertex that's involved in the triangle with this base, we're gonna split the polygon in the, into these two pieces with two different polygons and triangulate each of those independently. So in this case, the total number of triangulations is gonna look something like C5, plus C1 times C4, plus C2 times C3, plus C3 times C2. And then we keep continuing on, we'll have C4 times C1 and then C5. And you notice I introduced this sort of dummy variable C0, which is one. And I did that so that we have more of a symmetric type of sum going on here. We have products of the C sub i's. And you notice these products have indices summing precisely to five. The number of triangulations of this eight gone is C sub six. So what we have is a recursive equation that looks like this. C sub six is the product of the C sub i's where i runs from zero to five and the second product n in each of these products is C sub five minus i. Now this works in general. The fact that we were working with an acon wasn't special. So in general, the recursive formula we have for this C sub n's looks something like this. C sub n is C sub zero C sub n minus one plus C sub one C sub n minus two moving along all the way until we get to C sub and minus one C sub zero. Okay, cool. So let's actually use this to calculate some more of these values. Let's calculate C4. So C4 then, which is the number of triangulations of a six gone, is gonna equal C zero, C three, 
plus C1, C2, plus C2, C1, plus C3, C0. C3 is five and C0 is one. Uh, and then here we have one times two. Here we have two times one. And here we have five times one. So we have five, two, two, and five for a total of 14. So there are 14 triangulations of a six gone. That would have been really difficult to actually calculate by hand and verify that we had everything. All right, if we do the same type of calculation, it turns out that C5 is the magical number 42. So you notice, if you want an explicit formula for what C sub n is in terms of n, it's actually not clear here whatsoever what the pattern is for finding a formula. We'll come back to that, and instead I want to think about what other counting problems sort of have the same phenomenon going on or are counted by these numbers. So we're going to see one right now before actually getting the explicit expression for these numbers. Okay, so for our second counting problem, what we're going to look at is paths that start from the origin and go to, to a specific point on the line y equals x. Here I'm going to pick the point 5, 5. They are paths that are either going to go north or east with the restriction that they can't cut through the line y equals x. And the question is, how many of them are there? And it's going to turn out that the number of them is precisely counted by the same numbers that we have right over here. So an interesting phenomenon, let's actually see why that's the case. To get a motivation for what to do, we notice in our triangulation example, we cut our polygon into two smaller polygons. So one strategy here might be to cut any path that goes from 0, 0 to 5, 5, only moving north and east into two smaller paths in some way. One way to do this is to think about the first time that such a path touches the line y equals x. So for example, if I drew this path right over here, the first time that it touches the line y equals x is right over here. Okay, so if we look at this, it kind of breaks up into two paths that are also valid. This one right over here, which is a path of the type that we want with only two north and two east steps. And then this one looks slightly different, right? So because of the fact that this is the first coordinate in which it touches the y equals x line, we can actually think about it as the following. The last step must be a step going east and the first step must be a step going north. So we can truncate this and notice that it is a path of the type that we want, but on a fewer number of total steps. So we're gonna think about this this way in order to get our actual count. Let's see another example to see how this phenomenon works. So here's another one of the valid paths we're considering. It goes something like this. And we notice that this is the first point in which it touches the line y equals x. Okay, so because of that, we can truncate it looking at these points. And we see that we have a valid path on one fewer north steps and one fewer east steps. And then here we have one of our valid paths. Okay, so the number of things that we could have filled on this portion is the number of valid paths that move three steps north and three steps east. Um, let's say that C sub n is the total number of such paths altogether. This would be C sub 3. Okay, now the number of valid paths from here to here, where this is the first place in which we touch the y equals x line, is the number of valid paths with two north and two east steps by truncating as we did right over here. So the number of these is C sub two, right? And the product of these, because these two things are independent of each other, is C sub two times C sub three. Now this point could have moved anywhere along here. It could have been over here. 
It could have been here, 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 or here. And so this two right over here, depending on where the first point we touch the y equals x line is, would enumerate through all possible values. Here it was two, here one, here zero, here three, here four, and here five for this index right over here. So C sub six in this case, which is the total number of paths from zero, zero to six, six, is gonna be the sum of all these products where here we have this two, and we're gonna enumerate through all values from zero to five. So we'll have something like C0, C5, plus C1, C4, all the way up to C4, C1, plus C5, Z0. And that's exactly the kind of recursion that we had right over here. Great, so it looks like this thing that we're counting right over here has an interesting relationship to what we counted when we were looking at polygons and triangulating them. Of course, one thing we should check though is that they actually have the same base cases. Uh, so let's look at that. Um, so first of all, if we had a path that goes from zero, zero to one, one and stays above the line y equals x, well, there's only really one choice. We have to move up first and then right. So there's exactly one of those. Uh, and then we'll just check the C equals or the N equals two case as well uh, to convince ourselves. Here, there should be two possibilities. We can move up, up, and then right, right. Or we can move up, right, and then up, right. These are the only two possibilities for paths that are valid in our construction. Okay, cool. So it looks like this sequence counts actually quite a few things. The number of triangulations of M plus two gons, and then also the number of interesting paths of this type. It turns out that this sequence counts a whole lot of things. This sequence of numbers actually has a special name. They're called the Catalan numbers. And you notice, if you have a particular value of n and wanna know what that value is, you can use this recursion to actually figure out what that value is. But it would be really, really great if we had an explicit formula for what C sub n was in terms of n. If you wanna find out what that is, tune into this video right here by Michael Penn from Randolph College, who'll give a detailed construction for how to figure out what these values are in terms of n explicitly.